Nation is a multidisciplinary scientific evidence-based study and also a growing societal understanding of how we need to learn about how we recover from stress so we can become calm and alert. Um, so we have issues that are right in front of us, societal issues that we're dealing with right now. We also have had a, um, a decade, in particular 1990s, where we started to learn more about the brain and how it functions. But actually it was going on a long time before that. That was really when the public became aware of what we were learning, of all the kinds of things that were happening in our minds that we could learn about and help us. Behavioralism in school and in society has, uh, really has kind of reached its limits. We've decided as a society that we're not going to raise children with a big stick and a big carrot as our primary tools. Um, and we, so we obviously have to have some other ways to think about how we help to raise our children. We obviously, we've been talking already about the increased stress in society. And then we have such um, societal changes, huge societal changes, that we are switching from what used to be an industrial age, where we went to school in order to go to work to do a specific job and to be accountable to the employers for the productivity around um, completion of a certain product. And now we're moving very quickly into an information age, which means that we need to be able to be independent and creative and develop our own skill set and um, uh, individually offer something to a consumer-driven society. So all of these things are creating a perfect storm for why we need to think about how we deal with stress and how we can become calm and alert when we do get stressed, which is really the essence of what the study and understanding and application of self-regulation is. So stress, what is stress? Well, we think of stress as you know, people bothering us, things happening to us, and stress also, also has a physiological um, underpinning, right? We feel stress in our body. We feel that we get tight in our chest. Um, in particularly in Western society, we get a lot of tightness in our shoulders and our upper backs. And classic, if you look at postures of people in our society, a lot of people have their shoulders drawn up towards their ears. You can tell that they are experiencing stress that we would think of as really an emotional um, place to be or, or as a result of thinking. But what we're learning from the science is that stress really is a physiological phenomenon. And this shouldn't be really any surprise to any of us that we have um, different brains that are within. Uh, we don't just have our thinking brains, but we also have a reptilian and limbic system brains. And they also respond to stress. And so stress is really something that is inherently a threat um, to those lower levels of the brain before it's even registered as a thought. And there's lots of examples of that in our lives. And the classic example is walking down a street, and this is more to do with my life in southern Ontario, where you would be walking towards um, a dark alley, and you might have a sense in your gut that something might be there that is dangerous to you, and yet you don't really know it. And sometimes there is something dangerous there, and sometimes there isn't. But you have a gut response before you even have a thought about what's going on. So that's evidence that the body and the lower levels of the brain respond to threats before we even use our thinking brains and capacity. So self-regulation as a physiological recovery from stress involves change in energy levels and tension in the body. We all experience stress as muscle tension, as uh, um, headaches, were, uh, which are evidence of tension, back aches. Um, and we also experience changes in energy in our body. So we can feel activated and there's a purpose for that so that we can get away from stressors. We're built so that we can run away and or we can fight if we have to, to deal with the stressors to keep ourselves safe. Um, and obviously it involves um, emotional and psychological states that go along with the physical presence of physical experience of being stressed. So what do we do when we, uh, how do we usually respond to stress? Well, what we're learning in our study is that um, what happens is as human beings, because we are made to protect ourselves and because our ancestors needed to get away from, you know, the animals that would be after us, we would increase adrenaline. We would add energy into our bodies to escape or to fight with what's coming after us. And so we have a predisposition for increasing energy, increasing adrenaline, rather than breathing, decreasing the energy in the body, which is what we need as a society today. Because typically the threats that we experience 
are not threats like a tiger that's going to eat us, that we're going to get away. They are, th they are threats that our bodies experience that are a result of social stressors, um, uh, um, political stressors, their stressors as a result of the media, their stressors as a result of um, fear of things happening in the world that increase in adrenaline in our body is not going to help us to deal with them. We need to learn to how to figure out how do we actually reduce the adrenaline in the body system to help us to deal with stress. And an obvious way of doing that is breathing, because breathing, especially the exhaling part of breathing, allows for part of the nervous system that helps the body to calm, rather than put, so instead of putting the foot on the gas to deal with stress, we need to learn to figure out how, how we can learn to put our foot on the brake, which really goes against our whole evolutionary history and we're trying to understand how do we change this? How do we think about this differently? Can we in fact change our physiology in response to stress? Can we learn to do that using the thinking parts of our brain that, in, that can in fact impact the lower levels of our brain so that we can become less stressed even though our society day by day increases in stress that we have to live with. So people in part of the study about this, individuals uh, from a physiological perspective, have been trying to figure out how exactly our bodies respond to stress. And one of the most brilliant, current brilliant neurophysiologists, his name is Dr. Stephen Porges, and he has determined a hierarchical response. Number one, as a social species, we are supposed to use social engagement. So when we are upset about things, we need to go to someone else and usually what we do is we use what we call attached cry. An infant, when they are upset, they will cry out to a caregiver to help them to calm. And even though that's sometimes distressing to the parent because it's in the middle of the night, it is times when you're very, very exhausted, it's a necessary system as a social species in order to get that help as a vulnerable, small, Human, human child to be able to learn to calm themselves because we don't come into the world ready and able to calm ourselves. We need the presence of literally someone else's caring brain to help our brain to learn to calm through what we call the social engagement system. So that's the first level that we go to. If that's not available, if a parent or a caregiver is not able to respond to that child who is stressed, then the child might try to fight. But how does an infant fight? They can't fight or they can't flight. They cannot run away, which is what we can do as an adult. Happens level two, mobilization. What happens when infants is they have to bypass immobilization and then they go to freeze. So they just shut off. And that is actually a scary thing physiologically, is when a child just stops crying and people say, oh, hooray, hooray, they've stopped crying. Actually, what you've done is you've moved them to immobilization and freeze. You've not helped their system to learn to calm with the support of someone else that then leads them to be able to calm by themselves. Finally, and scarily, if if you go past immobilization or freeze, as we see in cases of trauma, intergenerational trauma, individuals will dissociate, which means that they disconnect from their bodily experience, their emotional experience. And, uh, and that, in our ancestral history, is the equivalent of, of feigning death, which means that the opioids start to flow into the body so that the animal that is chasing you, when they eat you, you literally won't feel it as painfully as you would otherwise. It has an ancestral evolutionary purpose that translates today into uh, people dissociating and having difficulties coming back into reality because those chemicals are so strong. And that's a place where we don't want anyone to be because that means that you need psychiatric help in a lot of ways. Okay, I'm probably, am I jingling the cord too much? Okay, so um, my, my boss, Dr. Stuart Shanker, in his book, Calm, Alert, and Learning, that's what CAL is for, he has come up with five domains of stressors. This is the briefest summary I can come up with. If, you find, if you're interested, you could find the Calm, Alert, and Learning book. Um, it's really geared in terms of, of school, but can be very helpful for parents as well to try to determine what are the things for you and for your child that are causing stress, that is causing them to go to fight, flight, freeze, 
and hopefully not dissociating as a result of stress. So stressors can happen environmentally when there's too much visual stuff going on, and this is a work that we're doing in classrooms, the brain has a hard time organizing and gets incredibly distracted by an awful lot of visual material. Um, we think that the, pr the overuse of, um, of technology is not helping with this because kids are being so bombarded and that's continuing to kind of fragment their ability to get themselves to calm and alert. Also causes a lot of chemicals in the brain to keep flowing that take you away from that, such as dopamine. Um, <clears throat> in terms of noise is probably one of the biggest um, stressors on the system. I think we've all experienced that to some degree or another. Some of us are more prone to be uh, highly sensitive through the auditory system or the visual system. And those of us who are, we know it, and we know that we need to take time in quiet to help to settle down, because we realize that it's increasing energy and tension in our bodies to be in particular types of noise, noisy environment. It's environments where there's reverberation, such as I'm experiencing right now. It's a lot of stuff coming back at me. If I talked on this microphone for several hours, I would be really exhausted because it would be way too much for my auditory system that tends to be highly sensitive. Biologically, we all know the impact of lack of sleep, right? It makes you feel t uh, energy and tension in your body. Emotionally, you feel stress as a result of lack of sleep. Relationally, you feel lots of stress as a result of lack of sleep. We know the, that impact it has on our ability to feel calm, which is a physical experience, an emotional experience, and a thought process experience, all of which are inextricably intertwined. It's really difficult to separate them out because we are body, emotions, and thoughts all together at the same time. Um, obviously, nutrition impacts. I talked about emotions. And cognitively, if you're having difficulty paying attention, sustaining attention with someone else, getting access to your thinking abilities, problem solving with others, you're going to have some stress from just having difficulty accessing those basic thinking systems. And so all of those things we need to consider when we do our work with schools, when we do our work with families and, and children, and we're trying to get more and more study and research of the impact of these stressors in, um, in different situations and how we can support families and schools. Okay, so how do we measure what um, common alert looks like? Well, we go to the work of, of Dr. Brazelton, um, Porges, and others, and they, they have created what we call the six stages of physiological arousal. They're really about energy and tension in the body. They were originally used in neo-intensive care units to try to quantify how those little bitty, bitty babies were doing functionally and what that meant in terms of energy levels in their body. We can all relate to these because it's about all of us. We have less energy at the bottom, we have more energy at the top. The issue is if you put on, you, on a break, you're going to decrease energy in your body. If you put on, if you activate some energy into your body or the analogy is putting your foot on the gas pedal, you're going to increase energy into your body. So we, we range from asleep, obviously less energy, to drowsy, almost asleep, which infants do so well and adults have lost that capacity. We just collapse asleep, typically, sadly enough. It's a really important place to be because it's the brain is helping itself to just slide down into sleep. Hypo alert, feeling zoned out, too tired to think. We all know what that's like. Alert, calm enough to be focused. It's the place where you can tolerate feeling sensations and thoughts and, they're, they're, and you're able to adapt to the situation behaviorally. Hyper alert, you're getting excited, angry, upset. You're feeling that energy flowing through you. You're starting to get more and more neck tension, headache. You're, you're getting more and more grumpy and upset, leading to fight, flight, flooded, where obviously some energy has to be released expelled because the body just can't hold on to it. We have lots of sayings in society that go along with all of these levels. You know, he's gonna blow, she's, um, you know, she's trying to keep a lid on it, right? We, we talk about these things inherently in, in our conversations as we observe each other behaviorally and what we see going on with others in terms of uh, emotional states and uh, physically how we're doing and how we think each other are doing in terms of our thinking abilities from moment to moment. 
So quickly, the Aboriginal self reg school, um, I've been working with the First Nation school in British Columbia. There are children there, age 5 to 14. They have preschool program on site. They have an integrated Aboriginal program that involves language and culture. Um, uh, they're really fortunate. They have two wonderful Aboriginal elders who are employed full time around in the school. And they use, they try to integrate use of First Nation practices as much as they can with both the students and the staff as much as they can. Um, looking at a grade three classroom, if I were to look at them through a self-control self lens, a very behavioral lens, I would say that these students, several of the students were unable to do independent work. They were, they looked checked out a lot of the time. There was a lot of verbal outbursts. They had, were able to do very little independent work. There were some kids who were literally running from the class. So how would you think about these behaviors? These are just a bunch of ratty kids, kids who are just, you know, they need to, Get, their, get themselves together, um, they need to do better, all those things that we would think of from a self-control lens, or would you think of them as children who, um, who are uh, physiologically set at hyper alert? So kids who, using that scale that I showed you, seem to be more, more predisposed to be functioning in the hyper alert level. They quickly go into flooded, they spend very limited time in calm, and their development is truncated in many areas versus children who just won't behave. And that has been the work with the school, has been changing the lens of those of us who are raised with a stick and a carrot to say, you just need to behave, and to try to understand what's happening in terms of stressors for these children that's creating this scenario that we're seeing with them. When we look at their stressors, a lot of these kids have poor diets, they have lack of uh, exercise, there were a lot of visual auditorily busy classrooms, their emotional growth is really delayed, as is their cognitive de um, uh, development. They have some pretty um, big difficulties in terms of socially, and we, we didn't get into that, but that involves um, understanding intentions and feelings of others. Their uh, understanding of others is very skewed, which is increasing their stress, right? If you have thoughts about people that really aren't very true. And they have difficulties around their cultural identity for obvious reasons. Their parents are struggling with their identity and therefore the children aren't, are as well. Um, looking at the situation where these children are living, no surprise to you people here, there's, there's quite a bit of chronic poverty. The parents are caught between the cultures, so the children are feeling very caught between, am I a white child, am I a First Nations child, am I both, how do I exist in both worlds, or do I exist in both worlds? They're, the parents have, have come, the grandparents have come out of residential school, so therefore the parents have limited parenting capacity because they were not parented well. There's much unsupervised use of technology, which is, as we know, is a society-wide problem. They have a preschool program, but there's limited access to it for a whole bunch of reasons um, that are getting in the way. So what do we do with these kids? Well, when I go in and work with them, I look at how many kids are at each of those different levels. So in, quickly in this classroom, there were a whole lot of kids who were experiencing a lot of time in fight, flight, flooded, a lot of kids. So we're talking 20 to 25 kids who were um, pretty consistently in the hyper alert. And I could only find that when the children were outside on the play equipment, playing pretty much parallel play beside each other rather than interacting, that that was the only time that they were able to experience being calm and alert. Um, and a lot of kids, some of the kids feeling hypo alert, so they're drowsy, they're falling asleep on their desks at school. So what do we do? We look to the teacher first because as the adult, the adult has to be able to regulate in order to help themselves to calm so that then they can support the children to be able to calm. The teacher identified that she liked movement. She needed to start off the day quiet. She didn't like the chaos in the hallway in the mornings. She likes to read to her students, that she likes to share and try out different ideas from other teachers, that she has lots of visual clutter in her classroom, that she needs to get rid of some of it. 
and that she's auditorily sensitive and needs to reduce some of the noise that's going on in there. Identifying in particular when asked, what sound in this room bugs you the most? The sounds of the desks moving on the tiles it was a big uh, irritation for her. So what did we do? Well, we looked at um, what supported the teacher first, because kids will follow the adult that they have the relationship with. And the teacher said, I need some more movement to get started with the day. Let's do an obstacle course. So when everyone else in the school is coming in, chaos in the hallway, getting into their lockers, etc., her kids are outside with her doing a different obstacle course each day. They come back after the other kids come in the classroom. They come into the classroom. They have a lovely soft start where there's, where there's uh, breakfast available. The kids can choose to do some silent reading. She started to introduce some plasticine, some really, you know, that hard plasticine kind of stuff, much harder than Play-Doh that you really got to work with to mold. She had to teach the kids how to use it. It became their soft start. The kids, once they had that experience, they could actually get some work done and she was feeling calmer, therefore they were feeling calmer, and they could get some things done. She put the tennis balls on the desk legs, and I'm finding out here that there are some other wonderful adaptations that can be bought, because I guess the tennis balls have some problems. She reduced visual noise with the, uh, the curtains in, in the classroom. I'll show you a bit of picture of what that is. And she, we encouraged her to keep her quiet voice, not to raise it, because that was really stressful for her. Her presence, she could be the strong, firm teacher in charge with her quiet voice, and how she engaged the kids was doing some beautiful hand movements that would imitate, for example, birds, and the kids would copy her movements, and that would help to settle them down when she could see them rising, hyper, hyper, hyper alert, getting to that flooded stage. So here's an example of decreasing the visual clutter, putting, um, putting the curtain covers on top of the the shelving um, units that you can do at home to just decrease so the eyes don't have to try to look at every one of those things and figure out what is there. There's examples of, of uh, decreasing the amount of stuff that's in the room, um, a allowing for a sense of more openness and freedom that she found was helpful for her. Um, involving the kids in the daily, so not only the, m the movement, the obstacle courses, but she made sure that there were lots of daily breaks, that kids would work in groups of two or three, doing lots of activities, moving around. It was well worth the time it would take to go do them, because when they came back, they were in a far better place to learn. So where are we after, um, s after six months in this program? Well, mornings she was getting for a really good chunk of time in the morning, she had 20 of 25 kids were quite well, well regulated for the morning with everything that she was putting in, especially with that initial soft start with the movement, the um, breakfast program, the plasticine, the silent reading, um, the hand kind of paradigm uh, imitating kind of things she was doing. She was getting some really, really good results in the morning. In fact, so much so that she was able to see the actual learning difficulties that some of the kids were having because they were calm enough that could, she could see what was underlying them and begin to look at where she would go from there. So then the questions were, okay, so now, now where are you at? Well, lunch in the afternoon is not looking so great because we have to trade off staff at lunchtime and then by the time they come back to me, they're a mess. So we talked about do-over start like re literally hit that reset button so she went back out to the playground do the obstacle course again get the kids regrouped like we're just going to restart all over again as a as a way to just regroup because it's about our expectations as a, also so her expectations were we set you up in the morning we're going to go all day well for these little people and for some of us at various times in our life when we're highly stressed we need to hit that reset button. We gotta find what it is that helps us to regroup, get ourselves settled down again, so that we can get on with whatever it is we have to do in our day. So um, where do we go from here? Well, she had learned that, si the kids had learned that silent reading was really a pleasurable activity. And one of the things that we're talking about in our study and our work is that children who have never experienced being calm and alert, they don't know what it's like. And in fact, it can feel boring. 
because when you're used to adrenaline throwing through, flowing through your system, why would you want not want to be in that place? So as a, as a result of doing the movement and then the coming back in and having some nice warm oatmeal and getting a book open, the kids learned that they could actually enjoy reading. So she was going to start using that as a break whenever the kids were done with stuff. There were the, the setup that they could get access to, um, to books and continue to use that as a break activity. We know that it's one of the best things for the brain because it is upregulating and downregulating at the same time for us to be able to read. And so if you are around small children and you can model reading whenever you have a break rather than sitting doing this that we all tend to be doing now, right? It's we're really doing our kids a favor in terms of helping them to learn by, by, by an adult model that reading is a really powerful way to help our brains to regroup. And it can be an incredibly enjoyable activity, as we all know. We talked about the do-over in the morning routine after lunch to reset. And <clears throat> her next goal was that the children would do the obstacle course without her. So we talked about what happens, you know, so you're leading them in terms of these activities that decrease stress, help their bodies to get back to calm and alert. What would you like to do to help them to be able to start to do it for themselves? And she identified that the children being able to do the obstacle course without her would be her next step. So she might do the morning one and then the children would independently go out and do it in the afternoon one and support each other as their own little community to be able to do that. I think that's a, you know, that's a really big trust there for her to trust the kids to get out there and do it, but she felt that she could get them going there. Then her other concern was the, um, the diet of the kids. So we talked about um, uh, respecting where the families were at in terms of what they could buy and what their eating practices were at home but she wanted to talk about exploring healthy eating through stories. So involving class projects where kids could just take a bite of a really healthy food as part of a story or a discussion point that would um, begin to introduce them. So the idea that sometimes we're planting today for maybe not what those kids are gonna eat in their current family system, but down the road, leading towards self-regulatory practices of healthy eating that maybe these children will eventually be able to step into and say, yeah, I remember when the teacher introduced me to spinach in a salad or, or something that was, or some sort of vegetable that was tasty to them that they might carry in the back of their minds when they have an opportunity to access it later and make it interesting and make it inviting and that was, she was gonna go with that. And then once the kids had actually been able to experience being calm, for example, when they're reading a book or they've done the movement activity and they've come back inside, she was wanting to introduce them to those six stages that I outlined. And there's several programs that have different kinds of language for children to help them to understand where they're currently existing on that self, uh, on the six stages. Um, and so she was gonna choose one of those programs. The point being that you need to be able to experience being calm and alert first by being regulated by someone else before you can start to be able to get there yourself. And if we can map it on to some sort of language and understanding, so top, bottom brain up, top brain down, integrate it in a way that is understandable. Our, our larger question is, are we going to be able to help children to be able to deal with stress better so that they will not you know, be, be as stressed out when they get older as they are even right now and as we are as a society is really what we, what we want to investigate. Um, and then I think finally, looking at the time here, they have uh, school-wide cultural practices. So I'd mentioned that there was a big presence of the Aboriginal elders in the school. So these are some of the things that they brought in um, uh, in terms of restorative circle and drumming opportunities and martial arts and yoga from more of the white culture in the community, um, local artist program. Uh, emphasis on displaying the children's art in beautiful displays to recognize their abilities um, and, ident and identify with the children. And at, towards this year, they were looking for class, looking into class pets. They've invested in a garden where they're going to grow some herbs. Um, 
uh, and then lo looking into more opportunities for different outdoor and indoor micro environments for learning and play to continue to expose these kids to different opportunities where we can feel enjoyment, experiences, living in our bodies rather than running around just using them and integrating that with the thinking about how we're enjoying um, being in those places of being calm and alert that interestingly enough don't involve technology which is where kids tend to gravitate towards. So I thank you so much for your attention for that whirlwind tour into what self-regulation is and the <laughs> Aboriginal school. Thank <laughs> you.